Hey there. Hey. What's your name? My name is Ellie LaFay. Hi, Ellie. Uh, where are you from? I'm from Modesto, California. Modesto, California. Did you go to high school out there? Actually, no. I went to high school in a town called Friendly, Nevada. Friendly, Nevada. What was that like? Small. Small it town. Very, it's very, like, we had uh, two stoplights in town, and it was a big deal when we got the third one, and we were really sad when it got turned into a roundabout. Like, that was oh. the big news when I lived there. <laughs> um, yeah, very country town, you know. Mm -hmm. Is it, uh, what is it close to? It's close to Reno. It's a little bit east of Reno by about an hour. Okay. And um, how did you like it out there? What was uh, high school like for you? Um, high school was not the best, but not the worst. Mm -hmm. I didn't really get, like, a lot of uh, bullying or anything like that because at that point in my life, I had learned how to avoid standing out, how to avoid interacting with people that would lead to bullying, mm -hmm. and would need be to just like act like really just unstable or like really just like creepy and people would leave me alone. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I learned how to get by high school pretty well. And I had some other weird friends like me, so it was cool. Cool, what kind of, uh, what kind of stuff were you into in high school? Did you like art or like sports or? Um, I was into theater. I mm -hmm. really liked um, doing uh, improv class and did the theater classes. Um, creative writing, I kind of liked, but not as much as the acting class. Mm -hmm. So I found out I wasn't really a writer. Um, my friend Click was pretty theatrical. We liked to make music videos and stuff in our spare time. So I got to like do the performance side of that, which was really nice. Really cool. What year did you graduate? I actually didn't graduate. I dropped out um, my senior year mm -hmm. uh, because we had moved to Reno. Uh, my mom had a husband at the time and he wanted to live in Reno. And she said, I'll give you till, you know, my child graduates. And when I dropped out, he was like, all right, let's go now. And I immediately got a job and got out of the house. The, the, that's why I dropped out was so I could get a job and move out by the time I was like 18. Mm -hmm. So you moved out. That's pretty, I feel like 18 is kind of common, but also more and more, it seems like that's actually really young for people to move out. So you moved out kind of young. I, I moved out as soon as I legally could because mm -hmm. my mom wouldn't let me move out earlier. I tried. Yeah. What did you, uh, what was your first job like? My first job was awesome. I was a pool monitor, mm -hmm. which is like a lifeguard, except I don't have to save anyone's life. <laughs> that's what my <laughs> boss told me. Um, so really it was, I listened to music. I checked people into a pool and I tanned for seven dollars an hour. It was really nice. Nice. <coughs> and this was all, this was in Reno or this was in Friendly? Oh, that was in uh, Reno. Reno. Yeah. Um, yeah, there was nothing, there was no jobs in Friendly. No way, I tried, I tried to work at a video store and, and try, I wound up, only way I made money in Friendly was mowing people's lawns. Mm -hmm. Very classic. <laughs> um, where do you live now? Now I live in Chico, uh, California. Uh, about how far is that from, say, like, Oakland? Uh, it's probably, I want to say, like, two and a half hours. Uh -huh. It's um, it's two hours from Sacramento, so. Okay, well, it's not too far. And uh, what's that like? What's uh, Chico like up there? It's nice. It's like a tiny, artsy, kind of hippie town. Um, there's... Just a the people that are really nice. I've made a lot of friends in one year there, which mm -hmm. has been really cool. And probably a lot of students, like young student life kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm, I just kind of, I think, vibe better with people who are in college because they're curious and they're wanting to, they haven't settled on what they know. Mm -hmm. And I can relate to that, I feel like. And they love to talk about what they're learning. Yeah, that's nice. That seems really nice. How long have you been living in uh, Chico? Um, just about a little over a year. I think it's been a year and a month now. Okay, pretty new. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, what do you do for work? Um, I drive uh, for Uber as a day job. 
and I'm like doing some burlesque uh, dancing at a bar and I do comedy and a few other things as like sidekicks but my day job that I do at night is Ubering. Mm-hmm. How do you like it? It's pretty good. Um, it, uh, it's, it's more up than down. I used to be a cab driver and that was more down than up. Uh-huh. Um, so it's, it's better. Um, I, I think any customer service job has some pitfalls to it. Uh, mm-hmm. I just think I want to get a job where I don't necessarily have to be constantly serving customers. Yeah, I can see that. Have you had any, um, uh, like any like strange experiences where you were like, that, that person was kind of weird or? Yeah, uh, there's, I think the strange experiences I have are when people are really drunk and then they, they hit on me, but they're hitting on me from like the back seat. So I can't oh. see them or anything. And they try to like, like reach up and it's, that's just very creepy and jarring because they, they think they're being like cutesy or whatever, but they're, they're, it's coming across as very creepy. <laughs> um, and I just, uh, sometimes people, I got, I got this one girl, uh, who got started for some reason wanting to talk with me about like feminism and it's, and then when I told her, I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm all about like the free the nipple campaign. I think that there should be the same rule for like, you know, men being topless for women being topless. If, if one gets to have their nipple out, so should the other or neither. Mm-hmm. And, uh, she, it was, she said she's more of like a 1950s feminist. So in my head, I'm just like, oh, okay, well, it's, it's 2017. So, <laughs> you know, like it's not, I don't know. But she said I was close-minded about the concept of gender. But I don't think she knew my gender when she said that. So I just thought that was really ironic and funny. Yeah. Huh. That is kind of strange. And what... I mean, I know a little bit about feminism, definitely about like first, second, third wave. So when, so she says like 1950s feminist, so I, I'm thinking like, uh, like the feminine mystique, uh, yeah, like, and like Betty for Dan. Yeah. Um, so, okay. I guess I could, yeah, I can understand that. Um, I just, I, I don't, but I wonder what did she mean by being closed minded about gender? Do you think? Oh, I just, she kept saying, um, how she just, just disagreed with the new way feminism was happening. And I said, I, I like, you know, feminism now because it's more inclusive. Mm-hmm. And what I was trying to get to is it, it includes me as sure. opposed to, you know, before. And I think that she just didn't like the fact that I just didn't agree with her mostly because I tried to let her know, like, I, I feel where you're coming from. I just happen to feel differently about it. Sure. And... She was very like she I the the like I guess the concept I could tell that she felt for me was like I was this naive, super liberal, doesn't think about what I'm saying, kind of just wants everyone to be good or just like I'm just being progressive because it's like popular and cool, but in actuality it's like I was telling her statistics I'd read and I thought they were interesting and things like that and um, basically she the vibe was she feels like modern feminists are kind of like taking advantage of men Mm -hmm. and I would, and I disagree. Mm -hmm. So that's where it kind of came from. Um, Do you still keep in touch with people that you went to high school with? Um, some of them, yeah. Like, my, my really close friend group, like, my best friends from high school, which is about three, um, I still talk to them. I mean, it got strange now that they have kids, and I don't. Mm-hmm. They've kind of changed as people, but we're still friends. Yeah. Um, do you have any brothers or sisters? Yeah, I have um, one of each. Um, they're both older than me. I'm the youngest. My brother's the oldest. Are they all in Reno? We've kind of all spread out. Um, I don't know where my brother is. After he came back from the army, we didn't really get along. And there's been issues, and I just don't really keep tabs with him. Yeah. And uh, my sister lives in, uh, like, somewhere in the area around Modesto, but it's more in the hills, more of a nicer area now. Mm -hmm. Um, She's doing really good. Does she have a family and stuff? 
Um, she doesn't want to have kids, probably because she had to raise me when she was younger. Uh, um, but yeah, um, she has a husband and a lot of cats and dogs that she loves, and she would rather prefer having those than kids. <laughs> They're less expensive. Yeah. Uh, what's the best job you've ever had? The best job I ever had, I think, probably was either my first job, which was what the uh, beginning and paid to tan, basically. Mm -hmm. um, I also got to work for uh, a haunted house. Uh, it's kind of on the 120, but it's um, by this north of uh, Modesto. I forget the name. It's like Deloso Family Farm. It's a big thing. Um, they Every year near Halloween, they do like a month long haunted house and I got to work there and it was just a fun improvised acting job where I got to be very expressive and play with my voice and like play with the costumes and stuff and it was all in good fun and I like and it was like I like kind of like being a clown kind of and it was close to that so mm -hmm. it was pretty cool that's really cool was it um like open to the public like people could come in yeah and... people came they paid it was like a whole structure was set up on the farm like like a whole uh, castle kind of thing uh -huh. and people went through it and down the different hallways and rooms and it was filled with actors to scare them and animatronics and all that stuff oh really cool so like from the central valley people kind of like in that area is like well halloween that's what we have our kids do and they have a corn maze there oh nice so that's what like attracts a lot of people um what's modesto like dirty oh <laughs> i guess it's um i was back there yesterday and i was visiting it kind of but i'm really glad i got out of there people like people are just really on edge and leery of one another hmm. there's a lot of like people taking advantage of one another in that town why do you think that is i think that people there's not a lot going on in modesto other than like a cannery or a couple other industrial jobs where they work the 12-hour shifts. I think that people are either have money and no free time and are miserable, or they have free time because they don't have a job and they have no money, so they're miserable. Yeah. Like, it's there's no balance. You know, like, I don't, like, I don't know if it's whose fault it is. I don't think it matters, really. It's just, it'd be cool if people could work, have money, and be able to enjoy their life a little bit, too. Yeah. I feel like that would only... I don't know, I've, I've quit jobs because I've been like, I don't even get to live my life. I'm just going to live on my money for a little bit and actually do something. Mm -hmm. What is one of the, your least favorite jobs? Like, what was a job like that that made you feel like this just isn't worth it? Um, I guess I'd have to say for that one, I um, when I was a cab driver... There was a lot of nights because I was just getting paid like, you know, on like half of whatever the fare is. And, but I had to work 12 hour shifts. I'd just be sitting in my cab, not making any money, just wasting my time being like, this is, I could be doing anything else. I could be probably just asking for change right now and be making more, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, it didn't feel, I just felt like that it wasn't a good deal. I just felt like it sounded like a good deal, but you don't know it until you do it and it just I guess I was kind of tired of getting taken advantage of for my time which is funny because now I drive for uber and that's totally better because I make more money and because but also it's like I get to choose when I work I have like more agency mm -hmm. in my job so I like it more so with the cab it's um you're more like a traditional employee so you probably have like shifts that you have to work yeah shifts but you weren't paid hourly you just made uh, like half of whatever the cab made and the other half went to the cab owner. Huh. So it's like, and there's other like systems where sometimes it's like you, you keep everything the cab makes takes in, but you owe them like a weekly fee of like 200 or $400. And it's like, that sounds great. Cause you're like, I can just go make all this money, but it, there's limited windows when there's high, volumes of people needing rides you know mm -hmm. it's like bar time mostly and if you work days you don't get that but if you work days you get like lunch rush and that's it mm -hmm. but now that i do uber 
I work lunch rush. And then I go home, eat dinner, and have, like, a day, and I go out for bar time, and I make more money doing that in less time. Mm -hmm. So it's, like, it's way better. Yeah, where we moved from, we moved here from Las Vegas, and um, there was just so much controversy because the, the cab, just the lobby, the power that they had over the city government, they were really resisting Lyft and Uber. Mm -hmm. And... Um, so I don't know a lot about it, but it seemed like a lot of people were upset because they, I guess those medallions yeah. are quite expensive yeah. to be able to, to do that. But here's, here's the, I guess, I don't know, as someone who was a cab driver and is now an Uber driver, I think it's interesting how the current, the old system, there was people who were like profiting off of it and they didn't want it to change because they were profiting, but the way they were able to talk about it within cab companies they were able to get the cab drivers to hate Uber. Hmm. Which I think is interesting because I was also kind of like, I was like, all these Ubers, you know, they're kind of like cheaters. They're not, it's not fair. Mm -hmm. But then I realized it's like, that's kind of like that like hazing thing. Like, well, something bad happened to me. So it's only right that I get to do something bad to someone else in the future. Right. But it, it, it's just like, once I switched over it, like I could, I didn't see that anymore. I was like, for the, for the driver, this is better drivers should switch to uber or lyft there should like a cab driver shouldn't be a cab driver a cab driver should be a driver that should, makes their own hours makes more money it's the person the only people really losing out are the people that own cab companies mm -hmm. but they're able to make like cab drivers be like i hate uber i just think that was really interesting because it's like it would be in the driver's best interest i guess to to like uber I wonder if people feel um, like there's just been so much change so rapidly that maybe they're resisting change, even though it may be better for them just because it's like, here's another thing that they have to adapt to and maybe people feel overwhelmed or something. I mean, I, I can understand that. I I grew up with the rise of the internet. Like I was a kid, there was no internet and I was a kid and there was internet and mm -hmm. I was always behind and I'm always, and I'm still behind. I don't know how to use the internet properly, but and I have been like resistant to learning new things because it's un it's always uncomfortable to learn a new thing. But it, I think that certain times we just try to make change be framed as a bet like change is bad sometimes mm -hmm. or too much change isn't good. But most change that sticks, I hope, is is like an improvement kind of change. You know, like we're trying to make things better. Like mm -hmm. we're like we went from like fire stoves to like you know what we have now like all the like electric burning stoves microwaves things like that we're we're trying to make things easier on ourselves and make things better and but change always takes something like away from someone who's adapted so perfectly to the way mm -hmm. things are but if there's someone else who's adapted perfectly to the way things are they really want it to change so you get people who are basically profiting off of the way things are and people who would profit off of the way things would be Mm -hmm. I, I like change though <laughs> I'm all about it I, 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 life has changed everything has changed you know we're constantly moving and doing things and if you ever completely stopped moving at like the cell level that's called being dead so like mm -hmm. life is motion and change and stuff like that so to resist it in a way, is kind of just like, I wouldn't say like it's like death, but it's like limiting life. It's like narrowing the bandwidth on life, kind of. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I'm kind of a hippie. Um, what do you like to do in your spare time? I've been really getting into like dancing more. Mm -hmm. um, I've been really enjoying that as like just a pastime and a hobby. Um, it just feels really good. Like, I don't. I used to do like free running and stuff like that, and I used to like do like martial arts, and, and I realized I just liked the feeling of moving my body. It's fun, mm -hmm. and doing that to music is even funner. 
And that doesn't need to be a point or a purpose. Like, it doesn't need to be to get more physically fit. It doesn't need to be to, like, learn how to fight. It's movement for the sake of movement. And it's just really nice. And it's getting me more into music. And I'm it's just helping my confidence, like, talking to people more. Um, I get out of the house more. But I also, when I go dancing, I don't want to drink as much. Mm-hmm. Because... I can't really keep my balance, but I want to keep my balance. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. It's it feels like, like when you're a kid and you get to play, kind of like run around and just play random like tag kind of games. Just it's nice. I think that's like my new favorite thing, basically. That's really cool. Do you go to uh, like places where you can dance, like clubs and stuff like that? Um, in in Chico, I, I pretty much go to like mostly. The gay, the one gay, well, it's not really a gay bar, that's what they say, but it's, everybody knows it as the gay bar, mm-hmm. even though officially it just says they're a safe space bar, an accepting bar, things, because they don't want to, like, try to drive any business away, mm-hmm. and it's, it's a kind of a conservative area on a larger scale over there in NorCal, so, um, but I like that, because I live right by it, they do a lot of really cool, um, DJs and dance nights and live music a lot of the time. And then there's this other bar I like to go to because on Wednesdays they have like like a dance night and it's all like 90s music. But I don't know, it's, it's nice to have something once or twice a week to do that recharges you, I guess. Because now I'm like, like tonight I'm going to go dance. And that motivates me to be like, well, I got to like do something like to make money and work. I got to Uber before I can go dance because I got to like... I want to get that over and done with so I can have the fun. Mm-hmm. And if I don't work, I don't have the money to go dance. So it, it, it's, an, it's a nice carrot, I guess, for the, at the end of the stick. Do you notice, um, do you notice like a community of people, like kind of regulars that are at the club? Yeah, um, especially people who are there to dance. Mm-hmm. Like they, they show up every week. I, I don't like some I used to do that for a sponge club every week, but pretty often. Um, and we see each other, we'll buy each other drinks, we just ask how each other been and we dance together. And there's not really a lot of words exchanged. I wouldn't say we're like friends, but we're like dance partners. Mm-hmm. And and the kind of just that very sense of like when I see them dancing, they see me dancing, we always kinda of gravitate to one another and dance together. And it's led to making some friends too. Mm-hmm. Do you have something that you would like to see or do before you die, like a like a um, like a country that you would like to go to, or just something? Oh, this is really so local? much. <laughs> Actually, I want to like, I want to skydive. I want to go to Japan. I want to go to Ireland. I want to see what Europe is like. Mm-hmm. I would really be interested in honestly seeing what like uh, New Zealand and Australia is like too. Mm-hmm. I want to go to Africa. I want to go. Um, I actually, I honestly want to visit the Middle East, but I'm afraid just because of what I hear. So until I can get over that, I shouldn't go, I feel like. Like, I need to get over my fear. Um, but I just want to see the whole world. I want to do everything. It's I just have this. But, like, I guess, like, realistically, I know that I'm going to get to skydive pretty soon. There's places around here saving money. So that's going to be... I just... I like experiencing new things or beautiful things like i like go hiking because of the view at the top not necessarily the exercise mm-hmm. i like to do, go traveling and driving because i've never been there like once a route gets familiar i kind of don't like it also i kind of want to i want to run a foster house that's something else i want to do before i die Have you had any experience with that, with uh, foster kids? Um, when I was in high school, some of my friends were in the foster care system. Mm-hmm. And then like when I was in elementary school, I had a lot of friends like that too. It's funny because like, I was in the foster care system, but we real bonded on like, the like you know what it's like to be neglected? Yeah, me too. Cool. Like, <laughs> I'll pay attention to you. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and I just saw it be okay, and I saw it be really bad, and I, and then I didn't see them when they turned 18. 
they're just gone. I don't know what happened to them. Hmm. And then I've met some friends when I was like 26 who were in the foster care system. And when they aged out, they had a really hard time. So I just, I don't know. What kind of things did they struggle with? Homelessness um, and not being able to get a job because you don't have any like job experience or like a home address or a shower to get clean. Mm -hmm. So that leads to uh, addiction problems, either selling drugs or doing other things to survive. And then the problems that come with those things you need to do, like the side effects to a medicine almost. Sorry. I just, uh, it sucks, and I just wish that, because they're, like, they're still kids. When someone turns 18, they're still a kid. Mm -hmm. You know, they shouldn't be just, like, we raise you, and then we cut you off, do it yourself. It should be, like, a gradual thing. Yeah. <sighs> what are things that you think could help, um make people more successful, like coming out of a, a program like that? I, it's hard because it's like, I think that everyone has kind of like a unique way to be successful. Because a lot of times I was struggling really bad and people would give me a lot of advice and tell me what I should do that would help me and it would never work out for me. And it's, it's like the world is so complicated, especially when it comes to like your place in it. Like, what are you going to do for your way to live? Mm -hmm. And it's like gener generationally like different. Like the way my mom made money and the way my grandma made money is different than the way I'm going to make money. So the advice they're giving me is outdated mm -hmm. inadvertently. And also it's like it's the wrong position, too, because it's like they want they have these different goals. They have these different talents like. Everyone is, I mean, I, I didn't think this about myself, but I do have a talent. I'm really good, actually, at being friendly, talking to people. And I used to just only hang out with people all the time, but I'm at, we, like, we get good at what we practice. Mm -hmm. So I guess if you're a kid and you're young and you're worried because you're in the foster care system, find things you like to do and just do them. Because by the time you get old, you'll be good enough at doing them that you can turn that into something if you need to. Even mm -hmm. if you don't think it's... I just hung out with people. That's not profitable, but now I try to be a, like a stand-up comedian. There, it relates in some way. There's a way to find what you're good at and relate that to having it be your thing. I just think trying more stuff, trying new things, keep trying stuff, and like don't listen to necessarily like obey no one, but listen to everyone. Like don't follow anyone's instructions, but watch and observe how people have gotten better. And find people that are not just people that are su successful, but people that are similar to you and successful will probably be a little bit better of a guide than just successful people. Hmm. Um, and when if there's someone that's it's it's really hard to say because it just requires it really mean, it takes someone who's an adult to give some compassion and let them be stick around after 18 that's really the thing that I've noticed that gives people the biggest leg up in being successful is how it's it's like one it's kind of like how successful the people they are around like when they were young were not just parents but it's like the whole it's like everyone you get to interact with as a kid if they were all really poor it's hard for you to not be poor mm -hmm. it i don't know it just seems that way and I don't think it's like because poor people are supposed to be poor people or because poor people just don't do the things that make the money. I think that like it's like a slow takes a like a long time process. But I think that some families, in a sense, have found a way to like slowly build up that like slow plus one, like a snowball effect rolling slowly up like down a hill. And other people have like the opposite effect, like they're coming from a place that's like a snowball slowly melting. Mm -hmm. So it's like, if you came from a place that was like always having less and less and less and less, it's hard for you to make something out of that. But other people have stuff to work with initially. And it, that's what I think I've, just in my opinion, what I've noticed that be, because there are rich people that aren't dedicated. There are rich people who aren't smart. And there are poor people who are more dedicated, more clever, 
harder working than like me and or people like it's not one to one it's mm-hmm. not like a I guess I could say it's not like a fair system but like people say the world's not fair that was the alarm right yeah so we're halfway so we're halfway through do you need a moment do you want to can I actually go off a cigarette would that be okay yeah sure sorry um it's kind of messy oh. in the back oh I don't mind going outside up front like oh, honestly okay. Like, I'm okay with that. Sure. Ah, uh, uh, the legs got stiff. Let's see. I'll, um, if you can kind of sneak by this away. Yeah, I can. I'm really small and nimble. I'll zip back up here. Okay, perfect. Awesome, thank you. Mm-hmm. I'll be on um, right back. Okay. Can I just walk in? Sure. And then, okay, so on this the time. second go around, um, this is where I like to do uh, just basically three minutes of silence. Okay, so let's start in one, two, three. Hey baby, what'd you call them? And just 30 more seconds. Yeah, 
That's good. Thank you. Thank you. The other day I woke up and I thought of a question to ask somebody, uh, which was, which of the seven deadly sins do you think is most harmful? Either to an individual or to society? That's, that's a hard one because it's like a toss up in my head between like, like I think wrath and envy, it's like those two is really hard for me to discern which one because I, I'm just going to say envy, I think, because a lot of times it can be, it's just never really good to envy someone in that way. It's good to look up to people and to maybe want to be like them. Mm -hmm. But when you envy something, you want what they have. You want to take. Or sometimes you envy something or you will view a person in such a way so you can envy them. Mm -hmm. So that you can kind of tell them that they have things to be taken when they really don't. It can be used in a lot of different ways to just take tear people. Up. It's like it's it's well, probably the worst against society because a society can't be envious of itself. Mm -hmm. It'll just tear itself apart, and probably to the individual. That's probably wrath because it doesn't serve a person to just hurt the people around them. Mm -hmm. It never like it like in the long run. It never helps you, and in the immediate, it doesn't even help you. I like that question, though. Yeah, and then another one I thought of, too. Do you think war, the act of war, is war wrath? Is it envy? Is it greed? What, what do you think war is? I think... War can have, like, a lot of, probably greed. Honestly, most war is probably about greed because it's traditionally, the, what I think of war is I think one country invading another, taking, like, b becoming a bigger country, mm -hmm. you know, or, or they want to do it to make themselves stronger in some way because it's a good deal will come out of it for them. They'll profit in some way. They want more, and they don't care that they're going to be killing people to get more. Mm -hmm. so yeah I think most war is greed but I think war can stem from any of them because I've seen misplaced pride I guess be like the starter of like big problems which you know it kind of was a part of World War II a little bit mm -hmm. when you think of like Nazis and misplaced pride you know, yeah. they, were, they were proud of being something that they weren't actually mm -hmm. and they it, it, you can't be proud for something you, no, you can't be proud of your genetics you have no control over it mm -hmm. you know but they convince them to be proud of something they have no control over and then you can blame someone then for something they have no control over but like yeah I don't know it's, I, don't, I can't feel pride for like being the way I was born I also mm -hmm. can't feel shame for it either though which is kind of cool it was beyond it was out of my hands mm-hmm What is something that you feel most proud of that you've done in your life or something that you've achieved or honestly, and this is, I guess this is probably the most we're going to like, like particular to me or whatever, but I am the most proud that I was finally able to become like confident to transition and become the real me mm -hmm. instead of lying for the sake of compromise, like, I felt like I had to lie. So I'm just really proud that I was able to get past that. And yeah, if I had to pick one thing, it would be that. Do you feel like the lie came because of society or because of uh, family or what were the expectations that you felt? I think it's a little of everything. I, mm -hmm. Cause I, I didn't get directly told as a child, you can't be a girl. I didn't need to be told that. I was told I was a boy, and I was told, like, 
don't do that. Girls do that. Don't do this. People will think you're a girl if you dress like, you know, like it wasn't, it was always like assumed that I would never want to be a girl. So I was just talked to like that. And there's just, it's it just, you get this impression. Like I might as well have been like, I want to be a duck. Cause it's like, it's impossible. Mm-hmm. Like that's the same kind of realm it felt like. So it's just this thing I never brought up because what's the point of telling people you want to be a duck? There's no way to be a duck. Mm-hmm. So now it's like, I don't know. I get mad sometimes cause it's, I feel like I got lied to, but I know no one tried to lie to me, you know, like they were just, everyone had the wrong impression, but I knew I was lying in some way. I didn't know necessarily in what way, but I knew I wasn't being honest about what I wanted to do or how I wanted to act. I knew that if people would, honestly, I thought people would think I was gay and I like girls. So I was like, that would just like ruin me for like trying to get a girlfriend. So I had to make these choices and compromises between like, I want this and I want this, but they can't exist together. People tell me, mm-hmm. but now it. I don't know. I'm most proud that I'm out, I guess. Did you feel, did you have um, a role model or someone that, um, I don't know, could maybe like someone who had maybe done it before where you felt like, oh, like so-and-so, if like, if they can do it, I could do it. Like that doesn't seem yeah. like the chasm is quite so great. I, I was at a point in my life where I had decided, you know, I want to do things that people call feminine, but screw it, I'll do it anyways. And I was calling myself a cross-dresser. And then I met someone who was trans. And they pretty much just took... I was just like, oh gosh, I wish I could be a girl, but I don't want to go through sexual assignment surgery. And they looked at me and they go, you don't have to do that. And you can still be a girl. And literally, I was like, what? That's not a thing. No, like, that's a thing. Just non-surgery girl. It's, that's a thing. And like, it broke my mind. Like, it was, like, someone could have might as well admitted that, like, no, I'm a vampire. Vampires are real. Here's proof. Done. Just been hiding in plain sight. Mm -hmm. Like, that's, once I saw someone doing it, and they kind of gave me, like, the, yeah, you're valid. That's true. What you think isn't this weird, by yourself, impossible thing. That's how you are. That's, that's a real thing. That, it, it, I needed that. I couldn't have done it without that. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it took, like me running into like a real life person that could talk to me and help me. So, and I feel like I've in, I've kind of almost done that once or twice in my life to other people. And it does feel really good because you're helping people get the kind of words and ideas that define feelings and perceptions they've had their whole life that they never had a language for. Would you say that's how it was for you? These were things that you had been feeling all of your life? I I always get the question a lot from people that, did you always know you were a girl? And I used to feel like almost ashamed that I was like, no, I didn't know. But how could I have known? I didn't know that was a thing. Mm-hmm. I didn't know it was an option. No one knew it was an option and we had never talked about it. It was just not a thing that ever got brought up. So I never knew I was a girl, but I never felt like a boy. That's the best way I could put it. I was around guys and I felt like this weird odd one out. Like there were the guys and then me. But I'm a guy, but there are the guys and then me. But why do I not like what? Why is there this weird different feeling? Why am I so uncomfortable around people who are supposed to be my like of my same gender? Why do I not like the kind of talk they have when it's all just them? Why do I prefer to be around girls? And the way they talk when it's just them. I just, it, like, I know that, like, th- to a certain degree, I probably, if I lived in a society where there can be, like, a guy who has, like, a feminine body and does the feminine things and is essentially treated like a girl, but that was just, like, guy type two, like, that we had, or, like, you know, whatever, maybe I wouldn't feel the need to be called a girl maybe but it's a moot point it doesn't matter really we live in the way we live now and it's kind of have to adapt to what is Mm -hmm. and the way i'm adapting is by i want i just realized most of what's inside me most of what i like 
would fall along the stereotype line of a girl. So I'm actually trying to just help people around me get a better heads up for the type of ways I'd prefer to be interacted with, mm -hmm. the ways I'd prefer to be talked to, the way I'd prefer to talk to other people. It's also heads up, you know, super misogynist jokes aren't going to make me laugh. I wonder, what, maybe because I'm a girl. Like, it, it, it's, it's to help other people know me. I'm, mm -hmm. I, you know, it's, I, I kind of like used to tell people, I don't transition so much for myself. I do it for society, so they'll stop being so wrong and how the way, like, they, all their expectations about me are just wrong. Mm -hmm. they, they were always wrong before, and now they're getting a little bit more accurate, so. But, yeah, I think that a lot of people are trans and don't know they're trans, basically. Mm -hmm. And they, there is probably people that have lived their whole lives, and they felt something wrong with them. And it never came up in their generation. And that kind of like kills me inside a little. Because it's, it's like that's, that's, that's a real problem. I don't know. Like that's because the way it felt before, it felt like I wasn't alive. It felt like I was constantly acting. It was like me and then the me inside my head. And now I am the me in my head. Do you feel like the transition has been um, uh, like supported by your friends and family or do you feel like it's been um, difficult for people? More friends than family, but mm -hmm. I was never really close with my, like I never really felt super close with my family. And I always thought that like, uh, it's probably because like, I just have issues with family. Like maybe there's something wrong with me. But I, I'm realizing now that it's not so much that I have issues with family or I don't like family in general. It wasn't my family. It was the person I was pretending to be his family. Mm -hmm. Like, they never really got to know me. No, Nobody got to know me, like the real me. And I, when I was trying to be the real me, it, didn't, it was too jarring to, for some of them. But it's because they thought they knew me. But they don't. Like, I'm sorry, I was lying my whole life, but I felt like I needed to. And it's, so they don't, they don't know my interests. They don't know what I like, really. So in a way, it's like somebody died. A, a lie person died. But they really were familiar with that. Mm -hmm. And it benefited them in, in their mind that I was this person they knew as opposed to this new person. So I moved. <laughs> I live in Chico now. You know, and my friends, though, very supportive. And it helps it not only happen smoother, but faster. Mm -hmm. Like, I was doing a lot of stuff literally, like, in the closet of my bedroom, like, putting on clothes, to now I am performing on stage because that's what happens when people believe in me, I guess, is I feel more comfortable to do things. It's... I'm really, like, fortunate that I do have people being supportive and being nice and considering me and considering my feelings when they talk to me and things like that. Even if there's even some people that like, they're like, I don't get it, but whatever you say. And that's just so nice to hear too sometimes. Cause it's like, cool. Thank you. Just, I just don't want to be argued against all the time. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't care. You can believe it. You cannot, you can think whatever you want to think about me, like in general, but just, if I tell you this is who I am, it's like if if you told me your name and I just mispronounced it, you know, and you're like, no, that's not how you pronounce it. I'm like, nope, it's it's Chaz. Your name's Chaz. It, it's, it's actually not. It's it's Kaz. Nope, your name is Chaz. Never heard Kaz before. Your name is Chaz. That just be offensive. And that's just your name. That's like one tiny little bit of how you identify your whole identity. Like it's one aspect to your identity is your name. A bigger aspect is like how you look, how you like where you're from. These are like bigger aspects. You like your name is like that cherry on top, and we still get mad when people get our name wrong. Mm -hmm. It's just disrespectful. To like, you don't have to like me. You don't have to agree with it, but it, you can't just. It's basically being like, no, nah, you don't exist. Not like just someone talking to you. It's kind of like that. Um that conundrum or that joke where it's like you go to the DMV and they want proof of birth and you're like, hello, 
<laughs> like I'm here. <laughs> so, but yeah, I'm, I'm really happy. I'm really, I'm, I used to wish, oh, I wish I grew up in like the seventies or the sixties. But I'm glad I'm growing up in this day and age now because, like, I guess some people think, like, oh, the best thing that happened or, like, the most, like, impactful thing of my generation of the millennials is the creation of the internet. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yeah, I kind of get that and I do agree with that, but not for me. For me, the biggest change that I could say from, like, when I was a kid to now, which would be, like, a change I can only equate to, like, the automobile from horses to automobiles, is it's not... It's kind of okay to be gay. It went from completely off the market, just bad, across the board bad, to being kind of okay. Mm -hmm. That's kind. Of, that's that's kind of amazing, you know. So, yeah. it the, we're like we're, we're we're talking about things finally that just would have just never been gotten close to being brought up. I feel like I don't. I think that relating to a place where we're getting more accurate a little bit with our words and how we define each other and maybe that'll help because i know that ambiguity and misunderstandings can be bad in like um, a two-person or, or like a small relationship so if i feel like if if our society is just a bigger scale of that and a more complicated scale of that more ambiguity and more misunderstandings can only hurt it so more words, more definitions, more accuracy in the definitions can only lead to like less accidental mistakes even because a lot of times you offend someone you didn't know you were going to offend them. It, so it's like if they if they let you know, hey, that I found that offensive, cool, you should just be like, sorry, I'll try not to. You know, like, but there's some people that just feel like, people always feel like, ah, Either people are challenging me or I need to challenge someone. Like people are like making me a sucker in some way or I'm getting a good deal. Hmm. And I just, I just wish we could get to a point where we all trusted each other more. Mm -hmm. I feel like when I tell people sometimes I'm a girl, they just don't trust it. They don't think I'm lying, but they don't trust what I said. They're dubious. And it's like, they're dubious about how I identify. Like, I don't know how else to like, like, it's almost like, if I told them I was this religion and they were dubious, but how can you, like, def how do you really, like, figure that out? You can't go inside my head and know who do I pray to inside my head. Right. So, like, I don't or know. what brings you peace or solace yeah, or, or so, any of that. So when someone's dubious about something that internal, I, I just it just makes me sad because we want everything to be so, like, that it's, like, it's unprovable. Opinions are unprovable. That's mm -hmm. why they can't be right or wrong. They, they're just, and they also can't actually, it, they can't be wrong, they can't be right, they can't be proven. If you can prove it, it's not an opinion, really, you know? So even if it was just my opinion, because you can't really prove how a person identifies, like how they feel inside, that's fine, because it's an opinion. And if it, there is a way to prove it, then I'm a girl. Like, there's no, there's no other way, there's no route of, like, in my head, I guess, you know? I just, I just wish we could live in a world where we're nicer to each other. Mm -hmm. um, what's somewhere that you've traveled that you thought was really beautiful? Um, I really like the like Tahoe area um, on the uh, west shore. Um, this the mountains in that area are really like the trees and mountains and the way the hills go down and everything. It's just amazing. Um, did it not turn on. Um, it did. I just shoot. Battery die. Um, no, it says no space on the memory card, but I just made space earlier, so I'm not sure. Shoot. Um, a big personality. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so this one, I think we'll just have to do. We might just have to do audio for the next, uh, okay. we only have six more minutes. Yeah, if you don't mind. No, that's fine. Mm. Shoot, I totally cleared space. I think I know what I did wrong. Um, okay. 
You learn stuff next time, though. Yeah. It's always good. Um, do you like movies? I do. I I like movies a lot. I like all forms of entertainment. Um, I used to just, when I was younger, I used to just sit and watch TV, like, all the time. But now that I have a job and have to have responsibilities, I get my screen fixed by going to the movies. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm... I hate it when I'm like sometimes I don't I don't like going to the movies by myself but I will because mm-hmm. I'll rather go to the movies by myself than someone who's wh- is trying to like pull me away from the movie I wanted to see. And it's like no let's not see that let's see this other movie. I'm like I I have no interest in that. You can go see that I'll go see this one. No I want to go together. <laughs> no I'll just go by myself. It's cool. Like I don't know. Mm-hmm. I um I really like scary movies. Uh, the movie Get Out. Mm-hmm is so suspenseful, like, and so well done. I was like, it's, it's been a while since I seen a movie that was making me, like, clutch things and hold them to my chest in just, like, this tense, like, oh, my God, what's going on? Yeah, that was a really good movie. I liked that one, too. Yeah, I mean, it was, it's so cool to see a scary movie not use a lot of gore or anything like mm-hmm. that because it, it gets so overused, and it was like there was very rarely anything, like, physical jarring like gore but the rare little bits they had in there you were just like oh my god oh my god no please no but i don't know i think that comedies are hit and miss for me some i used to like comedies a lot more but then i came out as a girl and i think that stereotype that girls just don't have a good sense of humor i think i figure out where that comes from uh it's you don't really want to laugh at jokes that shit on people when you're so used to getting shit on. Mm-hmm. So I think that's kind of like, because it's like, girls having a great sense of humor. Like, I love, like, and then there is kind of a difference I've noticed when I hang out with just girls or just guys. There is a difference in the types of humor that they have. But, like, I I just think that guys don't like uh, girls' sense of humor because guys will occasionally get shit on for being a guy in girl mm-hmm. humor. Which, that just doesn't have, like, guys get shit on in humor all the time, but not for being a guy, for being a dumb guy, for mm-hmm. being a fat guy, for being, you know, whatever, for some other extra quality. Yeah, all the time. Mm-hmm. But not specifically for, and they just can't handle it. They have, like, no tolerance for that. And, like, girls will shit on themselves for being a girl in their own humor because they're being kind of even keeled about it all because it's just a joke. Mm-hmm. It really isn't to be taken seriously. Um, so I just think it's kind of funny to me because... Because I'm a comedian and I've had some friends just been like, you kind of like, you don't like as many like things. Like, I feel like your sense of humor like, has gone down. I'm like, down? Or has it gone up? Is it better? Am I more discerning of what's a good joke and what's a shit joke? Mm-hmm. You know, just laughing at everything doesn't mean you have a good humor. What's being a, what has it been like for you being, doing comedy? Has um, it been difficult for you to get up in front of people? Has well, it been... I, I started doing comedy before I came out. Mm-hmm. And I was able to do it, and then it got hard just when I first came out because I had a whole bunch of material about being a short guy. I can't use any of that now, mm-hmm. and like, um, it was just I had to relearn comedy. That's actually been a thing I, on a notice. I've had to relearn and reevaluate a lot about myself because even when I decided things that I liked and didn't like, it was under the assumption that I was going to be living my life as a man. Mm-hmm. So of course I didn't want to do certain things, you know, but since that very root element has changed, my whole life has changed. I never wanted to have kids. I never wanted to be a dad, but I do want to be a mom. Mm-hmm. It's, it's different. It's a whole different idea. I like used to think I was really bad at dancing. Now I'm realizing I'm really good at dancing. Like I, all sorts of like just ways I, it's not that they're, I guess it is kind of like they're changing in the sense that I have to reevaluate it because there's just this whole new concept that I can incorporate with everything I do. Like, what kind of job do I want to have now that I'm a girl? Mm-hmm. What kind of, you know, whatever I want to live now that I'm a girl? It's totally different. And I don't know, I'm just, uh, I had to refine my voice, which is a, like a thing for like writers and comedians. They talk about like, what is your perspective? Mm-hmm. I, I, I have, I've, I've had to shift my perspective because, well, I mean, I just stopped faking a shift in my perspective. 
is really what it was. I was constantly shifting my perspective to like a guy's perspective and then talking from there. And now I just don't have to shift. And now when if I try to shift over there, it doesn't feel right. It's because it's not. It's cause, so like a lot of my humor like wouldn't match up for a little bit. It kind of dipped, but it's gotten back. And now it's better than it was ever at before because mm-hmm. I just have way more material. I I went, I did this um, show for Pride in Chico. It was a comedy show, and people today, like, even still talk about it. Like, that was, you were, like, one of the best ones there. It was a great show, but oh, my God. And I was like, wow, all I talked about was how, like, roller skates and roller blades were, like, known as, like, the gay thing. And I was like, you know what? It makes sense. You got your two roller blades right there. They look identical. They're always together in the closet. Yeah, <laughs> seems gay to me. Like, I get that. Sure, yeah, I'll, go, I'll agree with that. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that, though. Really nice shoes. If you ask me, they're faster, they're better. Okay, the last question I like to ask people <clears throat> is, um, what would you like to tell future Americans? Even if, um, I guess, educate yourself, be discerning with of your information, but never be so sound and confident that you just you know exactly what's right because when you get to that point you stop like like analyze yourself be hard on yourself and what you think figure out why you think what you think keep asking yourself why and it's okay to have a bad concept in your head it doesn't make you a bad person you know it, it just if you think oh wow i think that way how bad am i no you were just taught wrong basically and just Try to be nicer to each other on the everyday. Wave to each other, smile to each other, say hi to strangers. We shouldn't be afraid of of our own home. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming over. It was a pleasure.